we almost think about it as the safety of uh, airplane. There will be multiple layers into it. Like you could imagine that one layer might have to do with appropriate data filtering, or maybe then another layer has to do with injecting human feedback and maybe some like a final, let's say, discrimination by the model at the very end. You're listening to Gradient Descent, a show about machine learning in the real world. And I'm your host, Lucas Bewald. Today, we're talking to Wojciech Zaremba, who's one of the co-founders of OpenAI. And he's worked on the robotics team through most of his time there, where he made the hand that manipulated and solved a Rubik's Cube. And at Weights and Biases, we uh, have been working with him for quite a long time and rooting for his team. So I'm super excited to get tactical on robotics, but also Wojciech loves to think deeply about the bigger picture in AI. And so we'll get into that too. The first question I wanted to ask you about was what it was like starting OpenAI. You know, the, the first time I heard the idea when I met with uh, Greg in New York, and actually, even when I was about to meet the first time I overslept and, you know, we were about to meet at 5 p.m. And um, I had this like a weird working schedule that I used to do research over the night and I was going to sleep like at 6 a.m., 7 a.m. So I, I overslept for our meeting at 5 p.m. But uh, eventually we met. I would say early on, there was some like a discussion about the mission of the company. It's also interesting that back then in the community, whenever someone spoke about safety, they were considered a pretty much crazy. Many people are saying, oh, AI is so far away that it actually makes no sense to speak about it. There were even these quotes saying that it's like thinking about overpopulation on Mars. Mm -hmm. At some point that might be a problem, but we shouldn't be concerned about it today. Yeah, so I was also very excited, like... A, I told Greg that one of the most important people that we have to have is Ilya. Mm -hmm. And we've got Ilya. Uh, then there was a meeting around November 2015 in Napa. I, I met there with Sam. I met there uh, with Greg, Ilya, John Schulman. There was also Andre, who is now at Tesla. And of course, we, we discussed AGI. What are the steps? What do we think is missing? It was uh, also quite cool to see that the, these folks are thinking about like a, even during spare time about like a big fundamental questions so there was this time that we're like a sitting at the table and Sam Altman asked everyone what they think was the solution to Fermi paradox why we don't observe aliens and people had very sophisticated opinion about this topic and I was thinking, oh, that's the group of people with whom I would like to work. It's like they consider this even like a metaphysical questions because it's almost like the questions about AGI are almost like a metaphysical. That makes sense. But I guess what's kind of intriguing about the way OpenAI operates is like at its core, its mission is focused on AI safety, I believe. Mm -hmm. But it seems like the sort of remarkable results coming out of OpenAI, including the stuff that you work on, is a, seems less about safety and more about kind of showing the power of AI or kind of moving the field forward. Is, is that right? Or um, um, what's the thinking uh, there? So we have plenty of team working on safety. And one of the efforts working on safety was let's try to foresight what it takes to build AGI. Okay. So people started to look from perspective of resources, how the things actually scale and connect. And then they realized that we are able to make our models significantly better with appropriate scale up. And in some sense, that was actually a result of safety work. I also like another example, maybe like that is there has been a work on human feedback. So the idea is how could we inject human values into the model. How could we tell model what is good versus what is bad? And uh, of course, at first people started to work uh, in the, like, uh, the most simplified domain. So the question is, how can we tell model that the given summary of text is good versus bad? Mm -hmm. It turns out that actually this development led to capabilities, but motivation was from safety perspective. And our stance 
uh, regarding safeties, we would wish to maximally release the, let's say, capabilities and description how to build safe systems. But it's also very likely that it might be and the safety and capabilities might be the same thing. In some sense, safety means what to do to make sure that we can control the model. So there's like various levels of safety. One level of safety is what to do to make sure that we can control the model. And this is also very similar, like a from perspective of commercialization or capabilities. That's also what you want to happen. You don't want the model such that it go nuts when you are asking some slightly other distribution question. Mm -hmm. So when you think from perspective of our mission, that's the mission is to serve humanity. And there are actually three different axes, how you can distribute what we have developed. So one axis is you can literally just give people money. So I think like universal basic income, I mean, that still requires actually making a lot of money to make any difference to people. Mm -hmm. Second one is you can uh, give away technology. So you are, let's say, building technology and you are actually sharing it maximally. And third one is governance. So the question is how to make sure that the humanity as a whole can decide on what to do with this technology. And uh, OpenAI actually is interested in each of these axes. And uh, they're like at various stages. I'm kind of curious, do you fear... AGI, like you talked about Fermi's paradox, and it seems like one reason that we don't see aliens might be that they develop AGI or some technology and kill themselves inevitably, right? And, and may, that could be one reason that we don't don't see them, right? Do you worry about that? Do you put like a percent probability on that? Is that something you imagine might happen in your lifetime? Yes, I think it's possible, but I, I think that there will be actually various stages of AI development. The first stage is when AI will become very valuable commercially. And I believe that might be, you know, multi-trillion industry. Then second stage is actually AI might become a national security threat. So you could imagine that AI could be used to control like a farm of bots or uh, manipulate elderly or uh, sway public opinion for some election or so. And in some sense, you can say that it's already happening in some form. There is a selectively displayed content online that actually biases people in various ways. Yeah. Uh, the first stage is essentially that the value of technology is just keep on increasing. Second stage, it's national security. And then the third stage is existential risk to humanity. It's almost a question how they are spreading in time and so on. And Visually, we should just be worried that the initial parts of the sequence, and we should bear in mind all the pieces. We shouldn't so, just focus on the last one. I see. So we should focus on all three of those risks then. Correct. Or like a, the first one is not the risk. It's like an increase of commercial value. I guess maybe the risk might be job misplacement. Right, right. I mean, do you have a sense of, for yourself, a probability that you put on existential risk? It's actually hard for me to think here in terms of probabilities. Uh, I could tell you some convincing stories and it's also, I could, I, I noticed that these probabilities, they really change over the time, depending on the, some external factors and so on. So like what external factors change your probabilities? Because we're not really getting new information, right? Yeah. So I'm saying like external factors, like the political climate or so. Ah, I see. Let's see. So let me tell you the gloom story and I can tell you, let's say, positive story. Okay, great. Let's start with the gloom and then do the positive one. <laughs> In principle, I can say that the, it's almost like an inevitable that we'll build superhuman AI. That's, it's just a matter of time. Then it's also very likely that we'll end up actually with multiple organizations building it because it's so valuable and there will be a competition. There might be you know, some organization ahead but it's very likely that we'll end up with multiple organizations. Then we'll, there will be, then you can say, various people will be tinkering with the code of AI and AI will be tinkering with its own code. And it will have a powerful capabilities to achieve various goals. And initially this would be a goals, you know, given by a human. But then you can notice that at least in case of natural organisms that also are derived from a code that's a DNA code, 
there is this property that if you slightly mess up the code, it actually, the, the organism might misbehave. It actually might work against the host. So uh, in case of, in case of cells, it's actually possible to get a cancer and cancer is a prevalent phenomenon in the nature. So then you could imagine, you know, in case of AIs, maybe if you have a couple of AIs, then we actually know what they are optimizing for and who they serve. But once then there is an increased number of AIs and in some sense, you know, there's a process of mutation, which is AIs are modifying its own code, humans are modifying their own code, then there is a process of natural selection. And you can say that the AI that literally wants to maximally spread will be, will be the one that will exist. The things in the universe that want to replicate are the things that exist. Uh, here, the main difference is that AI will have just a uh, huge power. Therefore, it's kind of risky. What, doesn't the, like, what are the consequences of AI wanting uh, really just to optimize for replication? So I guess that's maybe a gloom scenario. Wait, one question I always have about the gloom scenario. I mean, it makes sense to me, but I feel like the metaphor of natural selection, well, at least with with plants and animals, we, we reproduce, right? So like you can't change the whole system at once, but it, it seems, it seems like AI might have a more kind of complicated system of changing and, and reproduction. Like you could imagine all the AIs changing at once or like communicating. It sort of seems like the, you might not necessarily, you could imagine a stable equilibrium, right? Where, where things aren't allowed to consume all the resources, for example, right? Or is there, am I missing something? It's possible that we'll have thousands of benign AIs and, uh, and it might be not that simple even to get all the resources, but you could imagine that randomly happens so that one of the AIs won't be that benign. And it happened because people are modifying code because it started optimizing different reward function hmm. and it still has a, you know, immense skills and then it can pursue its goal. Then it might be the case that other AIs are kind of defending uh, the system, or maybe they are never, they were never trained for defending. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very hard to predict the dynamics in multi-agent setup. Yeah. With one AI, you can maybe predict what, what are the possibilities. It would be still, let's say, extremely hard, but once you have many of them competing in some sense for resources. Very hard to say actually what might be the consequences. Okay, so tell me the positive story. I can say that even if AI would become so powerful, it wouldn't even care that much to be here. Just, it would just go to the stars. It would, you know, build all sorts of technology for us. It's like a, the same way as we are not competing with crystals. Crystals are also replicating. It's like a self-replicating machinery. It's kind of in different level of abstraction and it doesn't bother us that they are replicating. Of course, like there's like all the advancements that uh, could happen. So, so could imagine that AI would cure all the diseases, you know, uh, remove suffering, allow us to go to the stars, so on. It's interesting though, in both the scenarios, it involves steadily consuming resources and expanding. It's just sort of in one, the AI leaves us alone and the other, it, it doesn't care or maybe consumes our planet. But in both cases, wouldn't you think that we would see evidence of this in some other alien life that, that created an AI and, and came to us in some self-replicating way? Like, how, what so do you think about that? You're asking the question about Fermi paradox. Yeah, sorry, you met, you brought it up, so I, <laughs> it's top of mind. <laughs> So, isn't uh, there a collapse scenario? I guess. So, so let's say you said, oh, if aliens would build AGI and then AGI destroy them, but then we would see some traces of AGI in the universe, like uh, the AGI would consume a lot of resources. Uh, as, assuming that actually, once you are advancing your, uh, so, so there's like a few assumptions. Like uh, there is assumption that once you are sufficiently technologically advanced then you are just, you are spreading in every direction in the universe with a speed of light. And we haven't observed in any parts of the universe, anything like that. We haven't seen any Dyson spheres or so. So 
one simple explanation might be that actually we are alone in the universe. Maybe it's so unlikely for uh, life to flourish that we are alone. So that almost like I puts maybe more responsibility, but who knows? Is that what you believe? Mm -hmm. I have a probability distribution of our beliefs. Well, what might be the case? I tell me, uh, tell me, you can't tell me, reveal your distribution. So let's see. I can tell you a fun one that I heard recently. So let's say you are having super advanced civilization, then of course it might make sense to turn the entire planet into computer and and to kind of maximally use matter for the purpose of computation. Okay. And um, one thing that is actually interesting is apparently once the universe would be cooler, then it is possible to do more efficient computation. So one statement is that maybe aliens are just waiting for the universe to be cooler. But like <laughs> this is <laughs> I'm not sure if I believe in it. It's like I maybe cool, 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 cool description. So I guess how do these beliefs inform the work that you do? Like you talked about sort of two kind of bad AI scenarios that both actually seem very relevant to me. Like I sort of feel like the the sort of inequality feels real to me right now at this moment. And the political stuff also feels like it's starting to become real. And then the existential threat feels like you're telling me a very compelling story, but somehow it doesn't feel the same visceral fear for me and 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 my child. But maybe that's irrational. Like how do you think about is are, are those three worries what really drives you to do your work or are they more theoretical for you? And how do you kind of weight the different AI safety issues? Actually, let me at first, I can try to even describe where the usually the drive comes from. Okay. So, so as a kid, I did uh, quite a lot of mathematics and uh, I realized that, you know, in mathematics, I get... I, I've got a lot of pleasure by solving difficult problems. Okay? That all of a sudden, this like, like this amazing moment of excitement once I was able to you know to figure out a solution to some mathematical uh, problem, and uh, I actually realized that that's the main drive for the majority of scientists. That there is like a just very complicated puzzle involving mathematics and computers. And uh, somehow they can put all the pieces together and that actually gives them amazing excitement. So that's cool. But simultaneously, it would be very sad if due to this excitement, we would actually you know, destroy a lot of value or destroy how the humans operate and so on. So you know, there is a piece of me that is excited about the technology, about solving mathematical and computer science problems. And there is also part of me, like uh, thinking maybe from perspective of altruism and responsibility. It's like at some point of my life, I realized that, that ultimately the you know, happiness comes from within and I actually have already everything that I need. So then it's almost like my cup is full. The, just want to make make sure that actually yeah, that, that is enough for others. So then it becomes quite natural to think, how can I actually make sure that my work has the maximally positive impact? And uh, in case of AI, it is actually quite complicated. Why did you choose to work on robotics? So actually, here is a reveal I was actually working for several years on robotics and as of recently we changed the focus at OpenAI and I'm actually I disbanded the robotics team. Oh I'm wow. Actually, yeah. Why, why did you do that? So okay. So the reasoning is that there is like a few pieces. So it turns out that we can make a gigantic progress whenever we have access to data. And like a 
all our machine learning and supervised learning, reinforcement learning, they work extremely well. And there is actually plenty of domains that are very, very rich with data. Mm. And uh, ultimately that was holding us back in case of robotics. And I mean, this decision was quite hard for me. I, I, I got the realization some time ago that actually that's the best from perspective of the company. And the you know, sad thing is, I think if it would be a robotics company or if the mission of the company would be different, then I think we would uh, just continue. I actually quite strongly believe in the approach that robotics took and the direction. But from perspective of what we want to achieve, which is to build AGI, I think there was actually some components missing. So when we created robotics, we thought that we can go uh, very far with self-generated data and the reinforcement learning. At the moment, I believe that actually pre-training allows to give model 100x cheaper IQ points. And then, you know, that might be followed with other techniques. And what is pre-training? Pre-training, that's, I can explain it in case of GPT-3. So pre-training in case of GPT-3 or in case of like a language models means training them on some unsupervised task, such as next word prediction. And that builds in all the internal representation that allows model to off the bat to solve many tasks. And in case of robotics, we, we haven't had such a data. Mm. I see. So do you regret working on robotics? No, I, ca I think that actually we've got plenty of insights for other projects. I think that also we built a really amazing technology. I, I would say I'm actually very proud. There was like, a, of course, moments of sadness when I was making this decision, but I'm quite happy where, where, where we've got. Also, I would say even from my own perspective, in the meanwhile, I managed also other teams that made some significant progress in the meanwhile. And uh, the, 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 the more information, that there will be more information about it sometime. Cool. I guess one thing that I always kind of observe is when you look at what computers do versus what seems easy, robotics seems the most striking. Like I feel like the, the simplest things of like picking up an arbitrary object seems like the most natural thing for my brain and seems so hard, maybe harder than anything else that feels natural to make a, a robot do it. What do you think about that? Like, do you, do you think that there's more progress in the short term or will it be sort of the last thing that we solve on the path to AGI? So there are two possibilities for me, or like a few possibilities. So one is if someone would be able to actually in natural way to collect a lot of data, I think that might be the, the capabilities. Another possibility is that we just need very powerful video models, the same way as the moment we have very powerful text models, we need very powerful video models to take it off the ground. The trickiness at the moment with video models is that they just require way more compute than text models. So in case of text, uh, already an individual word conveys a lot, a lot of information and uh, just takes few bits to represent it. Uh, in case of video, if we would like, you know, to process images of a size few hundred by few hundred, you know, several frames at a time that requires orders of magnitude more compute. So I believe that if we would have models that have a really uh, powerful understanding uh, of video, it would be uh, way easier to uh, train them toward manipulation. There is also one more technical issue here. It's like uh, these models, most likely they would have to be very huge. And then the difficulty is in running them real time. Mm. So at the moment, at the moment I see few issues with robotics simultaneously, and it is ideal to be able to go after domains when the number of issues is like, let's say one or two. It's like that, that, that it's very favorable. It's also, it's also when we started, uh, okay, some sense, we started all sorts of projects at the beginning of OpenAI and we haven't had the you know, clarity how and exactly what we want to build. And over the time, we got way more clarity. 
and uh, the moment we can increase the focus in a given direction. So that's another question that I've, I've always kind of had is how does OpenAI think about the projects you pick? Like, I feel like, you know, maybe critics would say that OpenAI has sort of been too good at picking projects that are very evocative. Like you, you guys put out these, you know, GPT-3 and, and the, the music stuff that you did, like it's, at least to me, it just seems so cool. But I think maybe some people feel frustrated that it's like, it feels almost like targeted towards like a media event or something. Is that, is that something that you, you think about at OpenAI or I guess, how does OpenAI pick what to work on next? We have some internal beliefs, what has to be built for general purpose intelligence. There is, and people mostly choose projects around. There is also, let's say, there is a, some level of freedom to go after crazy high payoff ideas. I don't think ever that people are like saying, let's go after this one because it's a high PR payoff. It's more that we have amazing people in, let's say, and conveying our work to public. And maybe if we would uh, release uh, GPT-3 or Jukebox as TXT file, then people wouldn't say that it was for uh, that, 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 uh, that they wouldn't say such a thing. If you just did uh, a bad job with the PR, <laughs> then people yeah. would <laughs> give you more benefit of the doubt. But I don't know, like, I feel like, you know, you chose to win Dota, which weren't other people kind of thinking about this? And like, it seemed like it was sort of a very clear milestone I guess, as opposed to like putting out a paper on reinforcement learning at massive scale or something like that. Yeah, so um, there's also actually even element of even internal motivation with these significant goals. So the so I actually I think that the, that Elon suggested us to go after Dota, and the motivation was let's pick very complicated game such that if uh, if we would make a progress. Uh, it would be undeniable. Mm. So there is a lot of toy tasks out there. Like uh, for instance, you know, you can people work on uh, humanoid walking in Mojako, and this one is clearly, let's say, disconnected from reality because people can make it walk in the simulation for multiple years already, but none of it works in reality. And uh, here, in case of Dota, we wanted to ensure that actually what we are after it's meaningful so how to ensure that it's meaningful some people who are really devoting their life to actually play dota who are strategizing about it to play against us how much of the work then on dota was kind of you felt like fundamentally moving ml forward and how much of it was sort of dota specific or can you even pull those apart I think there was a decent amount of Dota specific work and maybe it was more than optimal, but also simultaneously. Uh, so I remember at the beginning of Dota project, there was, it was actually unclear how to approach it. People are saying that contemporary reinforcement learning will have no chance in solving this problem. And people looked into off policy methods, on policy methods, evolutionary strategies. And the thing that became quite surprising is that methods that already exist with appropriate scale work extremely well. So that was a big surprise. And I, I remember some people even before Dota uh, time at OpenAI saying that you know, maybe reinforcement learning is at that end. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, it's a very different story now. For sure. At OpenAI, do you feel like you're competing with someone? The way how I would like the competition to be fully perceived is actually a competition with bad outcome. With what? Bad outcome. Bad outcome. Mm -hmm. Oh, I see. Competing with a bad outcome. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't like us to necessarily compete against say other technical labs and so on but obviously there is some like a fear of being scooped or so mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting that in case of large projects i have seen it way less 
than in case of work of uh, individuals on the paper. So my understanding is that it's very easy to be scooped when you are working alone. And it's almost like impossible to get scooped if you work with, let's say, seven people. Why is that? So I think it might have to do that there is like a many people working individually, but very few ah. working as a group. It does seem like OpenAI is kind of maybe uniquely good at that. Like it seems like compared to academia, you have much more authors on your, or compared to ML research, typically you seem to do bigger projects and have more authors on your papers. I think that in reality, we need both. Sometimes we need these like insights from secluded individuals who like uh, work in their Kermit house for, for several months to, you know, figure out that there is actually a different way to build transformer or to train models or so. And it's almost like impossible to work on such a stuff as a larger group. But then eventually we want to build systems and the systems allow us to all the same take our work to next level, next level, next level. I guess what, what role do you feel like OpenAI plays that maybe the, the corporate, like, like DeepMind isn't doing or Berkeley isn't doing? I actually think that OpenAI has fair amount of push on safety that uh -huh. uh, it became a mainstream topic. It wasn't a mainstream topic. So I think that's extremely important. Yeah, I actually think that's one of the most important things. Do you feel like it's sufficiently a mainstream topic now? I mean, it's certainly much more mainstream than 2015. In some sense, we would like it to be sufficiently mainstream such that we would avoid bad outcomes. But I also almost think that the small bad outcomes might be a good thing because uh, then they will inform the public that actually these problems are real rather than uh, imaginary. At the moment, in case of GPT-3, we see some kind of rudimentary aspects of safety. It's more like on the side of controllability. We have a model that can have a conversation with you, but it's unclear how to make sure that the model won't be offending you or won't go off the track or won't uh, leak some like a secret information. And we almost think about it as the safety of uh, airplane. There will be multiple layers into it. Like you could imagine that one layer might have to do with appropriate data filtering, or maybe then another layer has to do with injecting human feedback and maybe some like a final, let's say discrimination by the model at the very end. Yeah, so I would say, I think that at OpenAI, there is a lot of discussion about this topic. And at the moment, some aspects of safety, they became even important from commercial perspective. Mm -hmm. And so it seems like you've made GPT-3 something of a commercial product. Is that right? Is that how you think about it? Yes. I mean, our thinking is that if we want actually to deploy AGI one day, then it actually might be very important to have a, a lower stake runs before. And mm -hmm. GPT is definitely lo lower stake run. We can see what are the ways how the systems are, uh, might be failing. Do you think there's any intuitions from neuroscience in general that can guide the development of machine learning models? There is obviously a question is consciousness independent of intelligence or how they are related? What would it make AI conscious? And I guess there are like a few proposals. You know, it might be the case that all what is needed to be conscious is to build a model of reality around. And at the moment, our models, they implicitly build such a model. And that would be a claim in direction that actually our models are conscious. There is maybe, that's maybe one axis. Other axis is other idea behind what consciousness could be. It's, it's like, a, you can look in mathematics and computer science for some very special mathematical objects. And you can notice that in mathematics, there is 
a lot of weird things uh, pop up once you allow mathematical system to be powerful enough to point on itself. In computer science, there is similar phenomena with halting problem. Once the system points on itself, there is like a undecisiveness. And I can say that maybe intelligence fundamentally has to do with compression. And compression and prediction are the same thing. So for instance, next frame prediction is actually compression. And once the system would become powerful enough that it tries to compress itself, that might be some in some way analogous to halting problem or, or to Gadel theorem in mathematics. And also some people claim that consciousness is not the property of information, but rather it's a physical property, most likely of electromagnetic field. And then that would actually mean that our AI wouldn't be conscious. It would actually have, it could have the same behavior as we do, but it wouldn't be conscious. So I frankly don't know which of this is true. And that's something that I actually keep on thinking uh, about, I would say a fair amount, because in some sense, consciousness is almost, or subjective experience is almost the only thing that I can be certain about. So when I wake up, that's something that I experience. I cannot be that certain about, you know, mathematical equation or that tomorrow there will be a new day, but I'm certain that I'm having conscious experience at the moment. So it is like an incredible mystery. And I think it should be solvable by science. And AI allows to, or, or in case of artificial intelligence systems, we can control every aspect of the computation. I guess one difference with consciousness and the halting problem, maybe there's sort of not a binary kind of consciousness on versus off, but it seems to me like there's sort of different levels of this. And I think we sort of intuit that in the sense that we, you know, we want to be kind towards other humans and we want to be somewhat kind to, to say like a cat, but maybe we don't put it on the, the same level. Like, do you feel like the models you're building might be sort of approaching the consciousness of a, of a worm or something. I mean, certainly they can do things that animals can't do. So, yeah, I, I frankly, I don't know. There is a Slack channel at OpenAI about, about welfare for artificial intelligence, because it is conceivable that through some kinds of trainings, we could generate immense amount of suffering, like a, a massive genocides. But frankly, we don't understand it. We don't know if, let's say, giving negative reward to model is the same as, you know, stabbing someone. Right. It seems that on its, at first glance, it seems maybe ridiculous, but then it's kind of hard to pull it apart. It's hard to really articulate what the difference is. Yeah, I mean... The interesting thing is, so I can see now path from here to AGI. You know, of course, it, it might take a really long time. And people are like, I think that there is a belief maybe that if model would be having human intelligence, then most likely it would be conscious as a human. Uh, the same time, at the moment, at the moment, I can speak with GPT. I can ask GPT about consciousness and it would tell me, yeah, of course, it would explain its conscious state and so on. Um, of course, it has to do with GPT being uh, trained uh, with data speaking about the consciousness. But the weird thing is, how would I be able to distinguish if indeed GPT would become conscious versus just knowing about it? I think there is maybe, there's like a few funny answers to it that come to my mind. So one is we could try to remove all the data that mentions consciousness, train model on it, and then have a conversation about consciousness. And if model would say, oh, that's something I was thinking about it. And I noticed this thing and that's so surprising that it's there. 
that would be maybe one way. Mm. Other way that comes to my mind has to do with even how to check that some other human is conscious. So one idea of verifying that some other human is conscious is literally by connecting brains. If you can connect brains and then look and feel that your consciousness expanded, then that might be an indication that someone else is conscious. There are, of course, various counterexamples into it, but you could imagine that similarly, if you would connect your brain to AI, and if you would experience that your consciousness expanded, that might be an evidence. Hmm. Well, that might be a nice note to end on, but I do want to kind of pull this back into a little bit more practical realm for kind of two final questions that, that we always ask people. The second to last question we always ask is what's a, a topic in machine learning right now that you think is underrated or doesn't have enough people paying attention to it? Maybe something that you would study if you were totally um, free to kind of start anew on some other topic. I actually think that the, I think that the models that can decide on its own compute budget that they can keep on spinning inside like a Turing complete, Turing complete models, like a universal Turing machines or the universal transformers, or you can think about something like having inner monologue as a means of just kind of increasing amount of compute that it's the model somehow while solving problem, it speaks inside of its head. I think that's what I would work on. Hmm, Cool. All right. And and the last question that we always ask, and this is for our audience, which I think is kind of a little more practically minded day to day than than the conversation we got into. But what's the thing that you think is the, the hardest part today of going from like a conceived model to a deployed model? And maybe specifically for you, I'm curious in robotics, like if you were building a robotics company or OpenAI was like geared towards just making a successful robotics application, which w- would be amazing. What do you think are the, the challenges that you need to solve today to, to make that work? So I think that there are actually two stages. So first stage is creating a model that is good enough for any deployment. And then second one is literally building minimum viable products such that there is a feedback and actually resources can be focused in that uh, appropriate place. And what might that look like? So you need something that's sort of useful enough that you could make a lot of it and deploy it so it's collecting data. That, am I understanding you right? Yeah. So, I mean, you could imagine, for instance, for the robotics company, seems to me that the problem of pick and place is actually completely tractable. I would also say that I wouldn't shy away from collecting data. So I think that the path that I would take now, if I would be focused on solving the problem, I would at first try to find a, some viable domain where there is, it, it, there's like a big enough market. The movement doesn't look uh, complicated enough. And then I would actually hire plenty of people to do their operation. And I would collect million trajectories and then train a model on it. And uh, I would say people are very excited about reinforcement learning. And I think reinforcement learning is very, very powerful. Uh, while at the same time, I'll say they shy away almost from supervised learning. And uh, in my belief, if I would have a company, I would double down on supervised learning. And it's, it's just, just keep on surprising me how, how far it takes. All right. Well, thank you so much. That was a lot of fun. Really Thank appreciate you, you getting up so early. <laughs> Thank you, Luca. Well, have a great day. Thanks for listening to another episode of Gradient Descent. Doing these interviews are a lot of fun, and it's especially fun for me when I can actually hear from the people that are listening to these episodes. So if you wouldn't mind leaving a comment and telling me what you think or starting a conversation, that would make me inspired to do more of these episodes. And also, if you wouldn't mind liking and subscribing, I'd appreciate that a lot.